Praise the Lord. First, I want to give reverence to the Father, to King Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, to Philip and Sharon. Let's give them a big hand clap, can we? And to all of you who are physically present and those of you who are watching online, this is the fourth in a series of teachings, and um, my recommendation would be, my suggestion would be, is that you go back to number one and number two and three because um, we're teaching essentially sequentially, and uh, whatever we teach in this particular session um, it follows um, what we've teaching, what we have taught previously. And so this is for you. This is for your blessing and this is for your benefit. And uh, so if, if it's all right with you, I want to uh, mention a, a number of scriptures. Uh, in the Hebrew songbook, uh, Psalm 103, verse 7. Um, you know, the Lord God showed his ways to Moses and his sons to, uh, and his acts to the sons of Israel. And uh, I want to remind you of uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding. And also verse 7, with all you're getting, wisdom is the principal thing, so with all you're getting, get wisdom, get understanding. And I uh, also want to highlight um, Ephesians 1 and 17, where, uh, you know, previous to that, Paul says, I've been praying for you. I thank God for you. I've been talking to the, uh, to the uh, God of glory, the Father of glory, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been praying that he would give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in your intimate knowledge of the Father. And then let me mention also... Um, I, and I didn't mention this um, in a previous session, but uh, uh, Corinthians 2, verse 10, where Paul says, um, you know, he, pre, what he's talking, he says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. And so I believe it was in the last session I talked about being caught up to heaven. And I talked about uh, being uh, brought into this place where there was an angel with a scroll. And one of the things that was written on the scroll was this. That the watch of the Lord is a key to the intelligence of the spirit and the ability to interpret the will of God. And so, um, part of my assignment right now is to assist you and help to prepare you for both a present and a coming move of God that involves uh, this end time and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so... Um, with that thought in mind, uh, I've mentioned those scriptures, and I'm going to mention some others, if I may. And uh, I tend to, um, how shall I say this, put some teachings in my phone. And uh, so I'm going to uh, start with my phone. And I'm going to uh, reference Matthew 13, verse 11, where Jesus answers and he says, now notice this phrase, to you it has been given. To know the mysteries or the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Interesting. It's been given to you to know. Interesting. Let's look at this phrase again because it pops up again. 1 Corinthians 12 and 7, to each it has been given the manifestation of the Spirit for common good. It's given to you 
to know the mysteries, to know the secrets of the dominion of heaven, and it's given to you to know or to experience the manifestation of the Spirit. Interesting. Then John chapter 3, verse 27, um, John the prophet, the forerunner of Jesus, says this, A man can receive nothing except it is given to him from heaven. Very, very interesting. And then you have Romans 8.32. He gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us all things? And so there is so much more that has been given perhaps than we have accessed. Now, if I can make you think for just a moment. Um, I want to mention this scripture. And this is from the book of Jeremiah 6, 16. And this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. As for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it. Interesting and you shall find rest for your souls. And then you already know Matthew. You know Matthew, chapter 11, where Jesus says, come to me. And by the way, in the Greek, it means to come and keep coming. Come to me, all you that are burdened and weighed down, right? And I will give you rest. Then he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. By the way, the Hebrew understanding is this. He's a master rabbi. He's saying, accept my teaching. Accept my interpretation of the scriptures. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you're going to find, again, interesting statement, rest for your soul. So it is given to you to have rest. And so in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and when you uh, walk in supernatural or navigational intelligence, God's going to lead you into rest. Let's take a look at the, whole, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to really get moving. But I want to read some more scripture to you right here at the beginning. And again, for those of you that are watching online, please go to uh, uh, Teaching 1, 2, and 3, because it's, it's, um, I'm sort of, I have sort of laid a foundation for where we're going to go. So, John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, number one, he will guide you into all truth. He will speak, not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So the Holy Spirit guides you, right? And he speaks to you, and he will show you things to come. Okay, so we have that truth, and then we also have this truth of Jesus, where he talks about the Holy Spirit, and he says in verse 26 of chapter 14, uh, but the helper, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to you in my nature, in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things I have said to you. And of course, you already know Romans 8, where it says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So you're guided by the Holy Spirit. You're led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. The Holy Spirit shows you things to come. So you're led by the Spirit. You're guided by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to you, and the Holy Spirit shows you things.
to come. Now, remember, um, there is a relationship between the manifestation of the outpouring of the Spirit, the glory of God, and navigational intelligence. Okay? So now I can start. <laughs> Let's look at how Jesus makes you a leader. And um, because in the last session we were talking about mapping. Before you even get saved by Jesus, the Father is preparing you for your future. You actually have a pre-salvation preparation. Now again, I want to say this. I realize that there will be those of you that are here now, and those of you that are watching online, you are really veterans in the army of the Lord. And so some things that I'm going to say, probably many things I'm going to say, you already know. But the way in which it's articulated may um, stir your heart or stir your mind so the Holy Spirit can give you further revelation around and in what I'm saying to you. Okay? So as you're listening to what I am sharing, also be listening to the Holy Spirit. He may highlight something for you at this point in time for you to teach, for you to father and mother, the disciples, the sons and daughters that, that, um, that Jesus has placed under your care. So you have pre-salvation preparation. Num that's number one. Number two, you have discipleship to Jesus. Okay? You come to Jesus and you keep coming to Jesus and you take Jesus' yoke. It's very interesting because the, uh, the history of that, what Jesus is saying, is that they would take a young ox and hook him up to an old ox and the old ox had the strength and the young ox was there with the old ox just simply to learn the trail. And how it would work is if the old ox decided that he wanted to move forward, but the young ox decided he didn't want to, the learning process would begin, particularly around the young ox's neck. <laughs> and if the old ox wanted to go right and the young ox wanted to go left, the young ox would learn. When the old ox goes right, you go with the flow. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So you're to walk with Jesus while he does the work. And this is a key to rest. And this is relational learning with Jesus. So you become like Jesus, meek and lowly in heart, and, 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 and you rest. I, I say this. This is discipleship. Then for those of you uh, who understand that every one of us is called to be a minister, regardless of our vocation, step three is the call of God recognizing the call of God upon your life. Now, Apostle Sharon talked about this being equipping meetings. So I have to recognize the call of God on my life. And so, you know, how it started, I got saved at like 16. And, you know, it's funny, you know, the book of uh, Philippians, and God talks to you where you're at, Okay. The book of Philippians says God works in you, giving you both the desire and the ability to do his good pleasure. And I remember after I got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, somebody was preaching, and I just all of a sudden had a desire to preach. God just put it in my heart. Now, you got to understand, 
Before I got saved, I didn't go to church. Mm -mm. I'm going to go on Easter and I'm going to go on Christmas. Otherwise, don't bother me. I ain't going to church. I have no interest. And don't talk to me about going to church. Because, you know, I had demons and you don't want to stir them up because I might get violent. So you better have a whole lot of Jesus. And so then, uh, eventually I got saved, and I got delivered from demons. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And so God put this desire in my heart. Now we're talking progressive revelation. And so then one day, I remember I was at a meeting, and this woman points her finger at me and says, God has a work for you to do. Well, that's all the revelation I could receive because that's where I was at. And then I was at another meeting, a tent meeting, and I remember this guy saying, um, I have, he's prophesying, he says, I have found your heart seeking your God, you should be my servant. So the revelation's continuing. Okay, so God's got a work for me to do, I'm supposed to be a servant. And then somebody else prophesies, <laughs> this is so funny, um, I'm calling you to a ministry you know not of. <laughs> Apparently I always need humility. But when you enter that ministry, the Spirit of the Lord is going to move you mightily. Okay? So now I know I'm called into the ministry. I got confirmation, right? Right? The general call. Right? Then, after the general call, you have the discovery of the gifts that go along with that call. Was that number four? You should write that down. Sometimes I don't make things very clear. You had the discovery of the call. So I ended up being a youth pastor, having that position for five years. I became an associate pastor for 20 years. And uh, then I became a senior pastor, and I pastor pastors. And um, you had the discovery of the gifts. Well, when I first started out, I didn't see any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in my life. I had a desire for the gifts. But... Um, I had to receive a knowledge or an understanding of how the gifts of God would work in my life. And it was very interesting because I found myself drawn to certain kinds of ministers. Okay? And so you would see a certain kind of minister and you'd go, I want to be like that when I grow up. Sometimes that's God's way of guiding you directing you, leading you, okay? And so sometimes that needs to be recognized. I'll just mention that. Then I think number five would be general practice. This is where you're, you, you know, you learn a little bit about maybe uh, all kinds of stuff in church, right? Maybe you teach Sunday school, maybe with the little kids, maybe you're with the youth, you know what I mean? Maybe you're in the choir. You're just learning all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? You, uh, you serve on the board. You, you learn a little bit about preaching, a little bit about teaching. Um, um, you know, you just, you just serve in the church. And, uh, um, you, you know, you, you, uh, you learn how to witness to people. You, you start praying for the sick. You know, maybe you might cast out a devil or two. You're getting experience. You're making lots of mistakes. Uh, there's a reason for that is you better get used to making mistakes. Because 30 years later, you're going to still be making mistakes. 40 years, 50 years later, you're going to still be making mistakes. So all I want to say to you that are watching, please get over yourself. <laughs> you're going to have plenty of company. Everybody's making mistakes. Okay? So please get over yourself. you got company. Number six, we're talking about navigational intelligence, is you develop specialization. You get really good if God calls you into specialization at something. Just like in the medical field, you will have a physician who is a general practitioner, and then you will have a surgeon, and then you will have a brain surgeon. 
then you will have a heart surgeon, right? You have a dentist, right? You have people with specialization, okay? You have a psychiatrist. There's, there's, you know how to do, you know, you're a, uh, you start out maybe a jack of all trades, but a master of none, but now you're developing various degrees of mastery um, in ministry, okay? And so um, one of the things that happened to me when I was very young is I went to bed and I had a vision. And in the vision, I had a belly. And I knew I had to be old. Because I was prejudiced against all fluffy people. I was an athlete. I was, actually, I was a star athlete. And so um, I had judged all fluffy people. However, once I became fluffy, I reversed my judgments. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. <laughs> I love fluffy people now. <laughs> but I knew I was old because I had a belly. And I was on this platform in this vision. And people were being healed and delivered from demons. And there was a certain way that it was happening. I came out of that and I thought, okay, well, in the future I'm going to have a ministry of healing and deliverance. Um, but of course, um, it didn't happen, it didn't start to really happen for like 26 years, in part because of a lack of knowledge, in part because, um, and please don't take this the wrong way, I know that what I'm about to say can be misconstrued, but there were basically no pastors that I knew who really moved strongly in the ministry of healing or deliverance or miracles. And so what happened was, because I didn't see it happening regularly or frequently, it, the very fact that it didn't happen became my normal. Okay? Now... Um, biblically, scripturally, as I quoted in the previous session in Mark 16, every believer, believer is to lead somebody to Jesus, cast out devils, at least to some degree, bringing healing to the sick, getting other people baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? All right? But where I happened to grow up, there was very little of that. Okay? And um, so um, I didn't really have anybody to teach me or to train me in that. And so there was a um, there was a there was a great lack of supernaturalism in Jesus, right? And so you can't now, now hear me. Um, you can't move in what you don't know about, right? Right. So, because here's the principle, please hear me. Um, the revelation determines the manifestation. And when you don't have revelation, you will not have manifestation. Okay? And if I can um, go here for a moment, um, Paul said in Ephesians 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But places is italicized. In the original language, you can interpret the word heavenlies to be domains, places of dominion, territories, plural, or realms in Jesus. That means that every realm in Jesus has a set of revelations that gives you access to that realm. Uh-huh. So you can't enter that realm in Jesus Christ unless you have a key revelation that opens up that realm to you. Okay? So, 
you're blessed with these territories. You're blessed with these realms. You're blessed as part of your inheritance with these uh, uh, places of dominion. It is yours. But without the revelation, you cannot access it. Okay? So, um, where, okay, where you do not have revelation, that's where you're going to have lack in your life. What removes the lack in your life is the revelation or series of revelations that will give you the ability to access supernatural supply. Okay. Now, um, I still haven't got to seven yet, but let me just proceed on this course. The realm that you sacrifice for becomes the realm of your supply. Because in the sacrifice, God is found. And when God is found, unto you are given the mysteries of that realm, that territory, and that place of dominion. And unto you, the manifestation, or the Greek word phaneros, which means that God does something visibly for the good of others. But you've got to have a revelation to break open that manifestation. With Jesus, freely all things are given to you. It's your inheritance. Like Ephesians 1 and 11 says, in Christ you have obtained, it's already yours, an inheritance. The struggle that I had for so many years is I did not have a relationship with anyone. There was no one in my circle who had an understanding of the revelations that I would need to step both into my identity and into my destiny. And so over time, the Father would cause me to meet somebody who knew something that I needed to know to assist me make that statement. So, um, um, Many people are, uh, and trust me, I get this. Um, okay. Um, all right, now, okay. You have to discover by the revelation of the Word and the Spirit your divine design. You must conform your godly desires to your divine design. You must conform your divine desires to your godly and holy design. Because when you conform your godly desires to your holy design, then God delivers to you his goods. When you desire something outside of your design, you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be frustrated. I was never called to be a musician. I would love to be able to play on that keyboard and sing. It's a really good daydream. But it's not my design. 
It's not my design. So I need to conform my desires, right, to the design, how God made me. Okay? So I don't try to be anything other than who he made me. I'm not trying to be like anybody else. Okay? I can't preach like T.D. Jakes. I rarely preach. I rarely preach. And there are um, church cultures where uh, they want you to preach. Mm -hmm. They want you to sweat all the way through your suit. Now look, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, every now and then, I get an, an I'm going to play now. I'm, I get an anointment to preach. <laughs> there is a preaching anointing. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God's upon me because he's anointed me to preach. Now, if you ain't got the anointing for it, don't bore people. Right? That's not really my grace. Oh, sure, does it happen from time to time? Of course. But it's not my thing. I teach. Right? Romans 12, gift of teaching. Right? I teach. Okay? So I, I ha um, okay, let me just, I'll get to number seven in a minute. But <laughs> I haven't forgotten. Um, uh, Ephesians 4 and 7, every one of us or each one of us have given grace according to the measure, the measure of the gift of Christ. But the word gift there is not charismata, it's doma, which means it's a gift of Jesus Christ. So, um, some people, okay? So we have to accept that. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Let me move off of that and sort of come back to it later. But never seven is going to be your legacy. Okay? Who have you imparted to? Who have you uh, invested in? Okay? You teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. You teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. Now, I'm, I'm sure that... Um, Nearly all of us are familiar with the story of Elijah and Elisha. And um, <laughs> Elijah is at the cave, and he's told by God to find Elisha. And when he finds him, and you can go back and read the references yourself, he's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. oxen. I mean, his, his plow. Yeah, he just, he just, in other words, he was able to die to what was. He was able to let go of the old and embrace the new thing God is doing. And you know, that's probably one of the most difficult things to do. I mean, I say, what is it, 43, 18, 19 says, you know, stop remembering recent things. Don't, don't, don't put it in your mind about remote things. Uh, Look, I'm doing a new thing, and now it's springing forth. Man, that's so uncomfortable. Okay? It's unfamiliar, and we fear what's unfamiliar because it can't be predicted. Okay? And um, <laughs> that's why you have to have navigational intelligence. So... And the outpouring of the Spirit gives that to you, you know, and the abil a supernatural ability to interpret because the Scripture says an interpreter is one, one among a thousand. So um, then it has been said, I don't know that this is exactly true, but it has been said that Elisha um, served Elijah about 10 years 
and did, quote, women's work. Now, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. Has anybody heard something different? Is it 15 years, 20 years? Does anybody know? It was a long time. Okay? So, this is where people also have their struggle. We want to... Um, we want to microwave our way into the ministry. Okay? Just give me an, an, an impartation without me having to pay the price. Okay? No, you need to be a crock pot. <laughs> Not a crack pot, a crock pot. You need, you need to be marinated, right? You need a slow cook. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm going to leave that alone. So it's interesting, toward the end of Elijah's life, he says to his spiritual son, God has sent me to Gilgal. The place where Israel was circumcised. The old way of the flesh is cut away. So, in navigational intelligence, you have to do a Luke 9.23, whoever will choose to come after me, let, he, let him deny himself of the self-life. That means there is the, <laughs> uh, there is pain. So discipleship involves suffering to do the will of God. Peter said it this way. No longer live the rest of your time to the lust of the flesh, but to do the will of God. And you know what's funny? Elijah says to Elijah, there was a school of the prophets, not, not watch this, that were there. They got circumcised in heart and mind, and the way of the flesh was cut away. They were separated to God. They were true prophets, but they were there. And Elijah says to Elijah, stay here. And he said, I'm not staying here. I'm going on. Right? And then he says, watch this. The Lord, and the Bible says the two went on. Hosea, the prophet, said, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Then it says, his going forth is prepared like the morning. You know, it just gradually happens. He will come to you now as the former and the latter rain outpouring. The Lord has sent me to Bethel, oh, the house of God, the place of the altar. Because Abraham built an altar to the Lord at Bethel. By the way, I'll just mess with you. This is the same place at Bethel where Jacob sees the stairway to heaven. And notice this now. Go back and read Genesis 28. The angels were not descending, ascending. They were ascending, descending. And at the top of the stairway to heaven, the Lord is there. Why? Because Abraham had opened up a portal there. So Bethel is the place of the presence of God. That's why Jacob said the Lord was in this place, but I didn't know it. So sometimes what we do is we pursue the manifest presence of God and we get happy and we do what? We stay there. And so, and they get to Jericho. Jericho is a place of tremendous spiritual warfare. 
but it's all the, also the place of supernatural breakthrough. Yeah. So sometimes we get really happy with supernatural breakthroughs. And he says, why don't you stay right here? He said, mm -mm, as your soul lives, as I live, I am not leaving you. And so then they go to Jordan, the place where you descend and die to yourself. Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And they cross the Jordan. And then Elijah has this to say, ask what you want. And he says, I want my inheritance. Let a double portion, watch this, not of the Holy Spirit, but of your spirit be upon me. You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I go, it shall be so. If you don't see me, it shall not be so. Actually, when you really read it, it means if you see eye to eye with me. Now that's interesting because in 2 Kings 2 it says God is going to take Elijah by a whirlwind. Which begs the question, why did God also send a chariot of fire that separated them? I would have missed God at this point. Because when that chariot of fire would have came down, I would have quit looking at my teacher. If you maintain eye contact with me. Because I would have said, whoo, you see that chariot of fire, the horses of the fire? But Elijah and Elisha, he kept, the, the, the disciple kept his eyes on the teacher. Yet did he recognize the chariot of fire and the horses of fire, but he kept his eyes on the teacher. And when that chariot came back around and picked his, his, his teacher up, his teacher also kept his eyes on his student or his disciple. And then he said, when he got in the air, he said, you have passed the test. And he drops the mantle. And then, oh, well, what's the real lesson? What if I was to tell you, that the final test is to be able to move in the supernatural without being distracted by it. And keeping your eyes on the teacher, Jesus. Okay. He walks back to the Jordan River. He strikes the water. Notice what he says. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the waters part. Now, um, if I can just do this, navigational intelligence. What God may do is, okay, this is a subject. You ready? I'm going to... Uh, um, <laughs> There are generational miracles. Let me give you an example of generational miracles. The sons of Israel have been delivered out of Pharaoh's hand and they've come to the Red Sea and Moses has an enemy pressing behind him and he starts crying and so he says to God, uh, do something, Lord. And the Lord says, what are you crying to me for? Stretch out your rod. Stretch out your rod. What does that mean? That means, and remember, it all started in Exodus 3 with God saying, what's that in your hand? So when Moses submits something natural to the Almighty God, it becomes supernatural. What if I was to say to you, the miracle's already in your hand. You just need an instruction to bring the manifestation. Stretch out your rod and east wind. 
separates the waters. The, wa the, the land becomes dry. The sons of Israel walk through dry land. I'll just mention this. This is interesting. It's, the Egyptians had been killing, had been killing the male babies in the Nile River. <laughs> when Pharaoh's army goes in, his men die in the Red Sea. So the judgment fits. That's a whole nother thing there. But but the but the sea parts, the land becomes dry, and then they and the revelation of wisdom, the re, the spirit of wisdom and revelation comes through the relationship and through the service. The spirit of wisdom and revelation comes on him through the relationship and through the service. And then when Moses is gone and it's time to cross the Jordan River, the spirit of wisdom says, this is how the miracle is to be done. Have the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant, but they must stick their feet in the water. Different generation, different method. Same miracle. This is why somebody says to me, I don't believe that miracle can happen if it's not in the Bible. Many things Jesus did with it when are not recorded. <laughs> but these are written that you might believe in his name. Okay? So not everything God did is recorded. But is it in keeping with the character of God? Is it in keeping with the promises of God? Does it glorify the Father through Jesus? Right? Okay. Interesting. So now we go down to Elijah and Elisha. Interesting. So now it's about throwing a mantle on the water. But when Jesus gets around, he decides, well, why part it? Why just walk on it? Okay. What am I saying to you? There are miracles reserved for this day that you may not have a reference point for in terms of how. But through your intimacy with God, you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because with regards to miracles, the key to miracles, because it's not the gift of miracles, it's the working of miracles. You got to have the wisdom to be able to do the work. That's why in, in Mark, this is the question, where did Jesus get this wisdom from that these mighty works were done by his hands? And the Bible says he could do no mighty work there except he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. But when it says sick folk, the Greek word there means people that are like invalids. So if the healing of invalids and Jesus could do no mighty work, <laughs> okay, Jesus is healing invalids. And it's not even called a mighty work. Pray tell me what's a mighty work. They're raised up off the bed of affliction and it ain't even called mighty. Oh yeah, I know. This will make you think. Just, just, this will make you think. So like in Roman, uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gift of the working of miracles. Then it says something really, really interesting, right? In Acts 3, um, a man who had never walked for 40 years, uh, Peter says, you know, I don't have any silver or gold to give you, but such as I have, you got to have it to give. Okay, in the nature of Jesus, in the character of Jesus, rise up and walk. Now notice the, how he administrates the miracle. Okay. I'm talking to you about navigational intelligence and manifestations 
of the outpouring of the Spirit and the glory. He has to grab him. He has to lift him up. And a man's feet and ankle bones get strong. Okay. Then he walks. In chapter 4, if you read, after you read chapter 3, if you read chapter 4, this is what the religious leaders say. We can't speak against it because it is evident to all in Jerusalem that a noteworthy miracle has been done. So the lame walking is called a noteworthy miracle. But when you reference Jesus, he says, when John, the forerunner's in prison, go tell John what things you see and hear. The blind see, noteworthy miracle. The deaf hear, noteworthy miracle. The lame walk, noteworthy miracle. The lepers are cleansed, noteworthy miracle. The dead are raised to life, a noteworthy miracle. So it's a separate category rather than just the working of miracles. But you've got to have a revelation. Galatians. He who ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Hearing of faith, he hears how to do it. Then in Acts 6 and 8, it says, Stephen, this wonderful deacon, did great signs and wonders. In the Greek, it means a miracle. Great is mega. So I don't know if that's many miracles or beyond just regular miracles and beyond noteworthy miracles. Big miracles. I like big miracles. And then it says that Paul did, okay, well, I should mention this. Then there is another category I named it because it's my teaching. I can name it if I want. There's another category called sovereign miracles. Sovereign miracles are miracles that God just does because he's in the mood, and you, it requires no faith on your part. None. He just decides I'm going to do it. You know, it's interesting. Remember remember when the, there was the funeral at Nain and Jesus stops the funeral? He never asked the woman if she can believe. He never says a word. He just says, you know what? You've lost your husband. You lost your only son. You're going to be totally destitute. Uh, the father, you know, this is interesting because um, like in Matthew 14 and 14, it says Jesus had compassion and he healed their sick. And the scripture says he had compassion on her. But the word compassion there is not agape. It's an entirely different word. And the best way to translate that word is um, love erupts and overflows. And so when he saw her situation, the love of the compassion, the love of the Father erupted so that he had to do something in her behalf. And that's how her son got raised back to life. Now, this happens all the time. Let me show you how this happens. Probably anybody who's listening to me now knows somebody who was in a car accident where the car was totaled and they walked out, sometimes with not even a scratch, and sometimes with some scratches. Sometimes they should have been dead, but they're coming out of it. Right? And we know what's happened to both saints and sinners. In fact, back when I was pastoring, there was a woman named Kim. She had all of her kids in the car. You can do with this what you want to do. There was an accident. The only problem with the accident was both cars went through each other. And nobody got hurt. Then I had another member named Pam. She pulled out. You know, she didn't see the car coming. <laughs> 
And that car didn't hit her. The car went right through her. Now, you imagine somebody going through you and you, you, you looking at them, they looking at you and you pass right on through each other. This is a sovereign miracle. Okay? And if you visit with people, if you get a chance to talk with people, get them talking, man, they'll tell you some amazing stories. Okay? Of God's goodness. So there are sovereign miracles. So um, let me go on to another category. And uh, this is a category I want to really break down in the Greek text. So I'm going to take my time to break it down. Um, in the book of Acts chapter 19. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not the kind of miracle I want to have to experience. But, you know, I'll take it. Um, let me give you something in the Greek. This is, um, I, I should, um, Greek text. Um, chapter 19. Um, in verse 1, it says, Paul came to Ephesus and he found some disciples. And uh, they were believers in Jesus. And then he gets them filled with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, they're baptized, and then Paul lays hands on them in verse 6. The Holy Spirit comes on, they speak with tongues, and they prophesy. And uh, he speaks boldly for three months, but when some had hardened their heart, he, uh, uh, he separates the disciples, and he's, he's teaching daily in the school of Tyrannus. Verse 10, this is where we're going to pick it up. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now here's where it becomes really interesting. And God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now the word here for worked um, is, has to do with creative miracles, but in the Greek it also means that Paul was shocked. It means that Paul was stunned, that he did not anticipate what was going to happen, and that it was surprise miracles. And in the Greek, it also means that once it started, it didn't stop. So I don't know if it started six months into his ministry in Ephesus. I don't know when it started. But once it started, it continued. Extraordinary here in the Greek means out of the ordinary, unusual, uncommon. But the thought in the Greek is this. It's unprecedented or something you don't have scripture for. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons, actually in the Greek, this is um, headbands and belts. But it's like, it's funny how history, because people... People use handkerchiefs, handkerchiefs as headbands now. And aprons you wear around your waist, belts. That even handkerchiefs and aprons or headbands and belts were brought from his body to the sick. And diseases left them. Now, we're when we're talking about sick here, we're talking about people that are too sick to go out. And when we're talking about disease here, we're talking about ter terminal illnesses. We're also talking about people with severe mental illnesses. Because it says uh, the diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. Now in the Greek, this what this actually means is for example, if they had somebody who had no hand, they would take the the uh, they would take the belt and they would put it right here, and the person would grow out a hand. That's what this actually means in the Greek. Now, these were warfare miracles because these miracles were to break the power of witchcraft off of people, and this is how you know it's true. Okay, verse seventeen. This became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks. Fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, because this happened after the sons of Sceva. And many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. 
Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them and totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew and prevailed. Now, if you go back and you look at the book of Ephesians, it has to do with heavenly realms and warfare. So those are extraordinary miracles. Now, here's the point. Miracles must be raised above the level of the witchcraft. Historically, it has also been said that Thomas went to India. The apostle Thomas went to India. And he stayed there, he went to a certain place and stayed there for three days and simply observed the people. And they had a god that they worshipped by throwing water into the air and the water came back down. And so Thomas just watched him for three days and then he got a word from the Lord on how to reach those people. So he, he approaches and says, how come your God won't accept your offering? So he takes water and he throws it into the air and it suspends in the air for days. People come and see the water hanging in the air and say, let's serve his God. Our God won't even take our offering. And they give themselves to Jesus. What's my point? The miracles must fit the culture. By the way, historically, Ephesus had a history in their history in witchcraft. They believed that items could hold supernatural power. Items could hold supernatural power. And that's why God selected Remember I told you the spirit of wisdom and revelation go together with miracles? Where did Jesus get this wisdom from? Okay, okay, let me back up. Um, Jesus did miracles to fit uh, um, uh, various uh, social groups. For example, the poor people in uh, Israel would say stuff like this here, if I can be a little southern. Let me tell you something. When the Messiah come, this kind of stuff they used to say back in that day. When Messiah come, his spit's going to be so powerful, even it's going to heal the sick. That's what they said. So Jesus would spit on people, right? Go wash, and they'd see. And it would be a sign to the poor people. Jesus would spit on a man's tongue and he would start talking. Ready? Then Jesus did signs that the rabbis understood because they believed, some of them believed that when you died, your spirit hung around your body for three days. But after the fourth day, you were gone. So Jesus waits four days. And he gave the message to the rabbis. And if you go back and read the text, it was that they said, we got to kill him. Right? The rabbis understood that if a person was born blind, whoever opened that person's eyes was the Messiah. <laughs> That's why they had a problem with the man that was born blind. When Jesus opened his eyes. Because that was a Messiah sign. So Jesus did signs for the religious leaders. And he did signs for the, for the, for the rich, for the middle class, and for the poor. Are you hearing me? Okay. Remember, uh, one of the disciples said to Jesus, we saw somebody casting out devils in your name because he in the part of our group. We told him to stop. And Jesus said, look, no one who does a miracle in my name is going to speak evil of me. 
Whoever's for us is for us. Whoever's against us, if they're not scattering, they're gathering with us. Does that make sense to you? So, um, okay. In the working of miracles, we're not talking about the gift of faith, but in the working of miracles, you must receive a specific outpouring of the spirit of knowledge or wisdom, revelation, or understanding in order to be able to work the miracle. Okay. I was in uh, Orlando, Florida, and I was doing a meeting. I was doing a regular teaching. It wasn't a healing service or miracle service. And a woman was brought in uh, in a wheelchair. She was fluffy. And the doctor had said that she would never walk again. So I had finished my message, and we're just praying. And when I looked at her, I thought I saw the Holy Spirit over there where she was. And then I began to have my self-conversation. Did I really see the Holy Spirit over there? I was not sure. So I thought, well, we'll just keep praying. And then when I looked a second time, yeah, the Holy Spirit's really over there. So now, watch this. Uh, miracles must be administrated. So when I go over there, I am led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you, right? He will show you, right? He will speak, right? He guides you. As men are led by the Spirit of God, sons of God, he will guide you, he will lead you, he will speak, he will show you. So I just started quoting healing scriptures over her. She starts moving. She gets up. She starts walking. She says, can I run? I said, no. Because she wasn't supposed to run. Because, you know, sometimes people's muscles have atrophied. And, and she's, she was walking normally. Baby, don't be running. Some people, when they get healed, they overdo it. Right. Right. Now, there's cases where, like, there was a case of a woman, and this was in Illinois. Uh, she gets up out of her wheelchair and she dances. But that was all right. In her case, it was all right. And I... I um, but I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna take one category of disease, and I'm going to show you it happens different ways. So this is funny, okay? Please forgive me for what I'm about to say. I'm in a church service in Missouri, and a woman is in a wheelchair, and I observe her. During praise and worship, she gets up and walks. So I want to know why. So I go to her, and I say, what happened? She said, God spoke to me. So I said, well, what did he say? She said, God said, get your butt up. So I got my butt up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apparently, however mama talked to her, that was love. Baby, get your butt up. <laughs> God talks to you according to your culture, but he still remains holy. Now watch, now watch, now watch. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm at a, I'm at a meeting, and, you know, it's like 48 nations. There are 600 people. It's a, basically a school. And I minister, and I think out of 600 people, like 169 people get healed. And, and so the glory of God is still there. So I go to bed, and they wake me up in the morning. Pastor Kemp, you got to come down here because the glory of God's still there. And in the service, there was a woman who was confined to a wheelchair, right? And the glory of God falls, and she hears a voice. Now, you could tell she was of a different social class because the voice said, rise and walk. So she gets up and walks, okay? Well, watch this. One, laying on of hands. Two, a voice during praise and worship. Okay? A voice during praise and worship. I am in um, I'm in Texas again. Where am I at? I'm in Borger, Texas. Spanish man comes in. He's 72. He has a stroke. He can't walk. Matter of fact, he has something going on with his arm. It seemed to me that I remember the sequence. Yeah, because now I'm talking about how to administrate miracles. The sequence 
was I was supposed to pray for his arm first. And so literally he could move his arm. He seemed kind of happy about that. You would be too. And then so I pray for him and he gets, he stands up and he kind of, he kind of does this thing with his legs and he starts walking. And then my wife says, because his daughter-in-law brought him to the church. She says, my wife says, have her, have him get, no, no, have her get in the chair, have him walk her around. So she gets in the chair and he first he starts walking her around you know, where the, where the seats are. Then he runs her around the stairs where the seats are. Folds up his wheelchair when the service is over and walks right on down the steps. But that was the sequence. Okay? Now I'm going to show you another sequence. I'm in Missouri this time and I'm preaching and this man interrupts my preaching. I'm not sure how I feel about that. He had had a stroke. His name was John. He had died four times. He goes to heaven. He meets Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going to send you back to earth, and I'm going to heal you. So I'm in the middle of preaching, and he had one of those walkers with four legs, right? So he's got us walk in and rushed my preaching, and he's, he's been over like this. This is how he's walking. So he comes up, I said, sit right there, and about four, about ten miracles happened, I think. And then when I felt like it was time, right, when I felt like it was time, then, <laughs> it was, okay, so Lord, how are you going to do this thing? So the first thing I was supposed to do was to pray for his legs, pray for his knees, pray for his head, okay, there was a sequence. When I do this, when I obey the Lord, the guy gets up. Now he stands straight up like this, and he starts walking. Now you know the church is losing it, right? And we had service that night. Now listen to this. And sometimes when people testify, they give you just like way too much information. He says, yes, I'm healed, and I'm feeling frisky. Boy, you got a multitude of healings going on right there. We just really didn't need to know that. <laughs> yeah. My point being, the Lord can fix you. The Lord can fix you. So here's what I'm saying right now. Uh, whoever you are that's watching and you got a problem with your hip, you're being touched by Jesus right now. God's healing your hip. He's healing your hip. And in fact, it's your right hip that Jesus is healing right now. And this is what's interesting. Your left hip is also being healed. Somebody else, your left hip is also being healed. Somebody else, you have bone on bone with your knee. God's creating a cushion between the bones and your knee is being healed. Somebody else who's watching me now is now for you. It's not now for me, but it's now for you. Is you were looking at a knee replacement. Jesus is giving you a supernatural knee replacement right now. And somebody else, you've been having problems with blurry vision. Your vision is clearing. Mm. Lift up your hands. Let's praise the Lord for a minute. I think, he's, I think he's doing something. Matter of fact, you've been sitting for a while. Maybe you should stand to your feet. Come on, just praise the Lord with us for a minute. Come on, praise the Lord just for a minute. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody else, you've been having problems with your stomach. You're being healed right now in the precious name of Jesus. Right now. Somebody else, you've been having problems with headaches. Jesus is healing you right now. 
Somebody else, you've been having problems with your shoulder. Jesus is healing your shoulder right now. You need to start moving around. Uh, uh, by the way, um, somebody's been having problems. It's kind of like neuropathy. Um, it's kind of like, on the one hand, it's a numbness, but on the other hand, it's a tingling, a pain in your feet. Jesus is healing you right now. You need to stand up, and you need to give him praise and start moving your body around right now. Come on, let's continue to give the Lord some praise. Give the Lord some praise. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, you have arthritis in your right hand. You're being touched and healed by Jesus Christ right now. There's pressure behind the eye. Jesus is causing the reason for the pressure and the pressure itself to dissolve, dissipate, and disappear. Somebody right now, you've been having at different times chest pains. Jesus is touching you. And Jesus is healing you right now for the Father's glory. Take your healing. Take it. It's yours. Take it right now. Take it. I'm telling you, God is doing something in somebody's legs. You ought to get up and start walking. I said he's doing something in your back, your hips, your legs. Get up and start moving. Jesus is touching you right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, I know you've been thinking about a hip replacement. And yeah, there's somebody who's watching me. You actually had a hip replacement. But Jesus is touching you and healing you. Pain is decreasing. Pain is dissolving. And pain is literally going away because you're getting a miracle by Jesus Christ right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Father. You, you know, this, uh, this thing with your heart palpitations, mm. you're, you're going to have a regular heartbeat. God's healing your heart. That micro uh, valve prolapse, the God's touching and God's healing right now. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we give you the praise. Lord, we give you the praise. Right now. Listen, we're going to teach some more. Please join us tonight. Uh, we're going to teach some more right now, but please join us tonight because I believe God's going to do some more things. Amen. Um, listen, I know you're discouraged, and I know you want to uh, quit. Um, but don't quit. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't give up. You are, I know you feel like you're going to fall apart and break down, but you're closer to a breakthrough than you know. And so if you will just keep going, you're going to see a supernatural breakthrough. Thank you, Holy Father. Yeah, I release the spirit of healing. I release the spirit of healing right now. And I thank you for it, Holy Father. I thank you for it, Holy Father. Um, you're being healed of a bladder control problem because of Jesus. And listen, if at some point you would do us a favor and somehow let us know that you've been touched by God at some point in time, we would really, really appreciate that. But somebody's bladder is being healed by Jesus. And Jesus is healing your kidney. Somebody, whoever that's for. I even see the word kidney failure. Jesus is, it's, it's like he's giving you a new kidney or it's like it's a restart. He's doing something new. Okay, Jesus is doing it for you. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Father. 
you know, um, when I was teaching, you were able to relate to this vision of having a healing ministry. It hasn't come yet, but it's on its way. I just want to give you a word of confirmation. And uh, yes, you should look up some of the old great healing evangelists like A.A. A. Allen and just observe how what they share and how they move and how they minister because you're going to get a revelation and an impartation in that process. So, Father, I release the gifts of healings and the working of miracles in that person. Uh, listen, or somebody, listen, you should do that 21-day fast. You should do it. The Lord is calling you to it. You've been debating, ah, yeah, is this me, is this God? It's the Holy Spirit. Obey. You're going to see God do something as a result of it. Go ahead and do it because the Lord is calling you. And um, <laughs> somebody else, the Lord is ca calling you to actually partner with this ministry. I don't know how that all works. Yes, it's prayer. Yes, it's commitment. But yes, it's also being a financial blessing to the ministry. You should listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, uh, God is going to answer your prayer with regards to Charles. Okay? So you're going to see the Lord do something there. Come on, lift up our hands and give God a praise. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yeah, start moving those feet. Yeah, start moving those legs. I'm telling you, Jesus is doing something for you right now. I thank you for it, Father. I thank you for it, Father. I thank you for it, Father. Yeah, the Lord is touching up somebody's eye, your eyes being opened up in the name of Jesus. And you know, you really ought to have somebody check that deaf ear, have them whisper in your ear. You're going to find out that you can hear. Jesus is doing it for you right now. So Holy Father, I give you the praise. Holy Father, I give you the praise. Listen, you should call friends. You should call neighbors. Make sure at some point they watch this particularly those that are in need of healing. There's a cancer healing right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I give you glory. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, you should really start that church. You should do that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, you should go to the Philippines. God's got an assignment for you right there. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, there are signs, wonders, and miracles just waiting for you in Nicaragua. Thank you, Holy Father. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, I'm getting ready to close, but I need to make two statements. One is this. In terms of navigational intelligence, um, 
every ministry needs a platform. You um, have to know how to platform your ministry. Um, here's, let me say it to you like this. When it was discovered that in the ocean there was oil, somebody said, how are we going to mine the wealth? And somebody said, I know, let's build a platform. And so you have to have the wisdom of God on how to platform your ministry. Let me give you an example. The Lord Jesus gives Sid Roth an idea. Because Sid is a, uh, a general of evangelism, but he's also a general in the area of the supernatural. And so the Father gives him this idea to become an investigative reporter and to the platform is to go on to TV and have guests talk about their experiences with the Father, with Jesus the Messiah, and to tell amazing stories, give teaching, talk about God encounters to lead people to experience Jesus the Messiah, and to educate people about what God is doing supernaturally today. And that became his platform. So your platform fits your calling. Your platform fits your gifting, your anointing, and your ministry. And if you happen to be a pastor, one of the things that you're called by God to do is to identify people in your congregation who have various callings, and if they don't know how to build a platform, get the mind of God on how to create a platform for them. It will actually expand and extend what God has called you to do. You get to father and mother them into their ministry. So every minister needs a platform. Here's the thing. That platform must fit your personality. Okay? It must fit with your calling. And so part of nav navigational intelligence is, is platforming. So, for example, I'm only here because of Gwen's initial platform. Philip and Sharon are here because of that platform. You're here because of that platform. So this is not a platform that I have created. It's a platform that's been provided so that I can do my part in equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. It is just as much a blessing for you to have your own platform as it is to platform others, and to platform others as well as it is to have your own platform. So your platform could be as simple as sitting in the kitchen, having coffee with somebody, and ministering. It could be as simple as having a home meeting in your living room. Okay? It could be as simple as having a coffee house ministry. Your ministry could be in the mall. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So it's what sort of platform are you supposed to have right now? Because let me tell you something. Once you get the platform right, God starts to manifest himself and pour out his spirit there. So it could be anywhere. You find out where God is and you go there. I'm going to tell you a secret. Okay. There was, there was a, uh, a person, they were saying, Lord, bless my ministry. Lord, bless my ministry. Lord, bless my ministry. Finally, God said, you know what? I'm not interested in blessing your ministry. I'd like for you to bless my ministry. So the question is, is who's this about? So find out where God's moving and go there. Right? And it might just be at your neighbor's house. <laughs> you know what I mean? It literally might be right there. So when I'm talking about platforming, I'm talking about finding out where God is. Maybe he's just waiting. 
Okay, let me say this and then I'll close. I'm going to try to close. As soon as Elijah says to Ahab in 1 Kings 17, there will be no rain or dew these years, but according to my word. God says, turn eastward. And in, really, the thought of it is, is go back to antiquity. Go by the brook Cherith. He said, for I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Okay, here's the key. God meets you in the place where he told you to be. God meets you in the place where he told you to be. So God always meets you in a place called there. Okay? God says to the prophet, go to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you there. That's where you see the miracle of multiplication, in the place where God told you to be. I don't know how long that brother had to walk. I don't know how many miles from where he was to Zarephath. Was it 30 miles from where he was? Was it 50 miles from where he was? Was it 100 miles Yeah, so, and the reason I'm saying that to you is because, to be honest with you, I think it was somewhere between 70 and 100 miles, depending upon where he was, you know what I mean, on the Jordan River when God spoke to him. See, so, here's my point. Sometimes before the miracle, it may require some strenuous effort on your part to get where God is. And I know sometimes we want it to come easy. But to quote Ringo Starr, it don't come easy. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I just couldn't help myself. You know what I mean? It's okay. <laughs> All I want to say is, while you're putting out this, the, uh, that effort, God just wants to hold your hand. All right? Okay. <laughs> I just couldn't help it. All right. So, Holy Father, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, Sharon, come. Oh, yeah, we can do questions. Yes. So. I, I have a question. Yes. Sharon has a question. Okay. Yes. My question is, mm -hmm. I heard something about, and you just mentioned it, so that, mm -hmm. that really was a, a mm -hmm. okay. Tell us about mall ministry. Oh, mall ministry. Um, yeah, I, um, I have a thing called Miracles at the Mall. Miracles at the Mall. So, um, um, I sometimes, okay, well, let's say I'm home and I want to get out of the house. So I'll, I'll go to the mall, and there's this, this place in the mall where I live where it's, um, there's, the ceiling is open, there's like glass, and the sun shines, and there's like a, a, a place to sit, and there's f a, a water fountain. I like, I, I like sun shining, okay, and I like water running. It, it, I find it very soothing. So um, sometimes I'll sit there. So one day I'm sitting there, and this young man comes up who doesn't know me, and he walks up to me and says, I feel like I should talk to you. And I said to him, yeah, you should. So I pray for him, and God touches him. Well, these young people start coming, so they would come one by one, and I, the Lord would give me, like, revelation knowledge. So I would, um, like, tell them stuff about themselves. Um details about their lives. And so then they give their hearts to Jesus and they bring in another friend, right? And so I would tell them stuff. And then they bring another friend. I think we had like 12 in one day. And um, give their hearts to Jesus. And so then the other place that I would hang out would be uh, in front of the pretzel shop. And uh, not that I'm into pretzels necessarily, but it's where people congregate. And so one day I'm ministering and people getting healed by Jesus and these, these two white sisters, one of them says, when you get done with them, now they're strangers, when you get done with them, we'll take some of that. Okay. So God heals them. And so um, 
you know, we would lead people to the Lord in the mall. We would prophesy to people in the mall. God would do miracles. I remember the man getting baptized in the Holy Spirit at the mall. And so um, we, we, would, um, we would, and I remember walking through the mall one time. I'm seeing this guy. He says, hey, I don't know this guy. He said, you still working miracles? Yeah. He said, keep working miracles. I don't even know if the guy was saved or not. I'm just passing by. So I'm going there. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking that Deborah and I, I think uh, we was going to go to a movie, right? A date. We were supposed to have a date. So I'm waiting for Deborah. And I'm sitting here. And um, this man and this woman approach me. I think she had a curvature of the spine, scoliosis. And uh, uh, you, Tony? Yeah. Well, my wife, I hate to disturb you. <laughs> well, my wife's got a problem. <laughs> we pray for her. God straightens her spine, heals. They're crying. God's moving. Did we ever get to our date or not? And we eventually got to the date. So my record was, um, my record has been, you know, uh, 10 miracles in five hours visiting with friends. And so then we would do stuff like, um, uh, back when I was pastoring, the, the, uh, the local alcohol and drug treatment center would send us 10 people every Sunday, 15 people every Sunday, 20 people every Sunday to church. And so they would come and and then, you know, eventually they let me in to the treatment center. And so I'd go in and I would say, well, um, you got two drug dealers and one of his name and the other his name. And uh, you were in a White House and in this room right here, this was what happened. And they'd fall on the floor. Nobody knows this. And when you were eight, so-and-so, this happened. And this is where you keep your stash. <laughs> <laughs> you just do a little bit of that. We we'd have like <laughs> we'd have like thirty people get saved. Bam, bam, bam. You know, a person would come to the church from the treatment center in a wheelchair and go back walking. Right? And they'd be actually behave better. So we want to send you to Tony's church. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or some maybe lay you maybe you know, and God would just do miracles. I mean it was just crazy. So um yeah, so we would we would um, we would do stuff. Even when I was doing traveling ministry, if I got a chance to get back to the treatment center, I'd do it uh, or minister to, uh, yeah, on the street, miracles on the street. Um, here's what I'm really saying. This will make you think. This will make you think. Okay, let's do this right here. Tell me the miracles you remember that Jesus did in the synagogue. Now that's count them. Raise your hand. The man with the withered hand, you just did that's one. The woman that was bent over, that's two. He cast out a demon, that's three. Having trouble, ain't you? Having trouble, aren't you? Now let's watch this. Let's look at Jesus' miracles in the community. Raise your hands. Raise your hand. Tell me. Yes? Ah, let's, one by one, because I want to make it a point. One by one. Woman with the issue of blood, number two. Jairus' daughter, number two. Yes? Healing of the leper and the lepers. Yes, sir? The demoniac. Yeah, 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 that guy. Peter's wife's mother happened at the house. After that, she fixed him some food. It's good to have a healing ministry, right? Lazarus raised from the dead. Come on. Oh, yeah, 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 because that happened at somebody's house. Yes. The 12, the 12, yeah, the, well, the 12-year-old girl in Jairus' house. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Keep going. Feeding the 5,000. Feeding the 4,000. Yes. Healing the guy's eyes. I, I mean, the, how many of them were there? There was a bunch of them. Here's my point. More, okay, here's, here's where I'm really coming from. 
in Ezekiel has a vision, and the water of God flows out of the temple. A thousand cubits, right? 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 Ankle deep, right? Walk in the spirit. Another thousand is knee deep. Prayer, intercession, praise and worship God in the spirit. Waist deep. Further it gets away from the temple. The ability to reproduce. Chest deep. Touching the hearts of men. Overflow. <laughs> the further you get from the temple. Now I'm going to make you think. Because with Elijah, there were um, miracles that uh, were amazing. Like, for example, his own supernatural provision, right? Miracles of judgment. Calling down fire, bringing people to repentance, right? But let me give you a category just to make you think. What if I was to say to you, there is coming a glory where you're going to see more social miracles than you've ever seen before? Jesus did social. See, most of the time when we look at miracles, we're looking at miracles for me. Individual miracles. But, but this, this next move of God, you're going to see an increase in social miracles. Like the feeding of the 4,000. The feeding of the 5,000. Right? So, uh, Elijah heals the water so that the people can drink it, right? The land is barren. The land is healed so it can yield its increase, right? The disciples, the uh, food multiplies. Social miracles. Miracles that benefit the community. So, I mean, you can go on and on and on with social miracles. You know, so I, I want you to get your heart and your mind ready for an outpouring of glory that does social miracles. Okay? Uh, because they're miracles that benefit a whole community. Okay? And so think about it in that way. See, I don't know that we've ever ne necessarily even thought about the whole concept of social miracles. Water into wine saved saved a family from embarrassment. That's a social miracle. Okay? Um, so, Jesus is going to do social miracles. All right? Miracles that benefit people. All right? Let me give you, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, way back when they had the... Uh, the, uh, that disaster in Haiti, the earthquake. I remember listening to this woman who, who went to Haiti, and she had a pot of food probably about this big. She was showing compassion, feeding people. She was with another woman. At the end of the day, one woman said to the other, do you realize we have fed 600 people, but we have never put any more food in that pot? That's a social miracle. Social miracle. I was on a uh, a uh, a bus to go to Dallas. It was an eighteen hour trip. It was um, for a big conference, and the bus breaks down. And the bus and the bus driver, you know, the uh, the bus driver says we can't go anywhere. So I jump up and said, "We're gonna pray." I tell the bus driver to start it. He, you know, he looked at me like I'm crazy. Then his eyes got real big when it started up. And we made it. We made it. This is a social miracle. Okay? 
So these are the kinds of things that Jesus does. So um, did I hear a voice? I don't remember what happened. I don't know if I was led. I don't know if I was guided. I don't know if the Spirit spoke to me. I just know, nah, you know, God's going to do something today. Now, here's the crazy thing. I was 16 when that happened. <laughs> yeah. I, ha I would have these moments. Okay. So, Holy Father, we thank you. Bring every listener and every watcher, everyone who's watching, Lord, let the spirit of wisdom and revelation come into their life so that they can move in miracles. And Lord, all kinds of miracles, regular miracles, noteworthy miracles, mega miracles, extraordinary miracles, generational miracles, sovereign miracles, deliverance miracles, and Father, release grace and glory for social miracles. In Jesus' name, and Father, we give you the praise. Amen. Was I supposed to do more questions? I guess I am, right? But it's noon. Yeah, let's do a couple, and then we'll, we can close. Because we started at 930. So it's only two and a half hours. We can go a few more minutes, and we're going to let you go. Anybody else got a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a couple of days ago, before we started these meetings, you talked about, and maybe you're, maybe it's on the plan from mm -hmm. the Holy Ghost, but you talked about frustration and anxiety. Uh -huh. That when we were just talking together about how that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I think we were more specifically talking about vexation. Oh, that's a word. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that tonight. Tonight, okay. Well, that. So what, uh, let appetite? me just give you this introduction. You want to watch the next one. <laughs> because among other things, I'm going to start teaching on how you can be set free from vexation. And um, vexation will get in the way of your personal progress. It will, um, I'm going to talk about the spirit of vexation. And if you're a minister, you definitely want to hear about it. It's extremely relevant for right now. And uh, we'll probably go into some other areas from there. Um, yeah, uh, Satan's plan for you is containment, restriction, to keep things small <laughs> for you. Yeah. And vexation and frustration and fear and anxiety, but particularly vexation, that spirit is a big part of this. And by the way, if I can give you just this comment and you'll recognize this immediately, the spirit of vexation through this uh, 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 epidemic is attacking the earth. Amen. Let's look at the United States. Now, I have to say this, I'm not a Republican, and I'm not a Democrat, but look at the spirit of vexation. The Republicans are vexated with the Democrats. The Democrats are vexated with the Republicans. People are vexated with each other over political issues. It's a, it's a manifestation of the spirit of vexation. Then you have vexation that's manifesting itself in other ways also. But you have to view the next session <laughs> to hear the rest of the story. And by the way, I'm going to show you how the spirit of vexation impacted people even in Bible days. I'm not, this is not a new thing. This is an old thing. But let me tell you this. If you can get victory over vexation, you will experience an outpouring of the Spirit and, and new dimensions and manifestations of God's glory. All right? 
Anything else? Come on, sister. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah.